Welcome, everyone. I'm going to ask if we can get started in the next few minutes here. So if you've not had a chance yet to grab a sandwich and a drink, please go ahead and do so and uh, find your seat. Uh, my name is Lisa Cardi. I'm the Deputy Director of the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS. Um, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Kaiser Family Foundation and the, global, the Friends of the Global Fight. Uh, we're very happy to have with us here this afternoon Michelle Kazakstein, a longtime friend of CSIS and um, a leader in, um, in the global health movement. I'm newly arrived here. Uh, in fact, this is the first of these events that I've been able to moderate, uh, but I already feel quite at home. I think that's in part because CSIS is a very hospitable institution. I think it's in part because uh, we serve very tasty box lunches. It's a bit of a bonus. Um, but it's also because, particularly for this event, um, the Global Fund is an institution that I feel a very close association with. Over the last eight years, I've um, followed its uh, development with great interest um, from a number of different perspectives. And I was one of the group of people back in late 2001, early 2002, that was involved with thinking about how to put together the Global Fund's original architecture. And I have to admit, at that point in time, I think few of us could have ever anticipated the impact and the success that the Fund has enjoyed. Uh, the results truly speak for themselves. Um, HIV, at this point in time, more than 3 million people on ARVs, um, up from a number that was probably less than three or 400,000, I think, in early 2001, if that. Uh, TB, a 50% increase in detected cases uh, simply over the last five years. And I think even more um, remarkably, malaria. Uh, I believe in 12 African countries, 70% decrease in newly reported cases over the last several years attributable to the fund's efforts. Um, however, these remarkable achievements have only come as the result of the collective efforts of many, of governments, both donor governments and governments that have hosted the fund's programs, of civil society, of communities of people living with HIV, and of the multilateral institutions that have supported the fund's efforts. It's truly been a remarkable alliance However, sustaining the current momentum, achieving even greater efficiency and impact, and indeed expanding the funds programs to the stated goal of $8 billion worth of both ongoing and new efforts by 2010 is going to be a major challenge, particularly in the face of today's economic crises. Fortunately, the, friend has many, the fund has many friends here in Washington, um, and I think the turnout today uh, tells us this is going to be a very important and timely discussion. Um, so, Michelle, you're really very welcome here today. Uh, but before I give you the floor, <laughs> I'm going to invite one of our co-hosts, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation, um, Alicia Carbide, to please come and offer a few words. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, and also thank you to Steve Morrison and Karen Meacham and their team here at CSIS. The Kaiser Family Foundation has a very long-standing, productive relationship with CSIS, and it's a partnership that we're particularly proud of. We're also very happy to be co-sponsoring this event today with CSIS and Friends of the Global Fight. On behalf of myself, Jennifer Cates, who unfortunately could not be with us today, and the Kaiser Family Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to this very, very timely discussion. We are very pleased to have with us Dr. Kazak Shkin, to share his thoughts on the successes and challenges of the Global Fund and the current issues facing the fund, especially in light of the global financial crisis and issues that may be facing the Global Fund in the near future. Yesterday, he touched upon some of his thoughts on these issues. He participated in Kaiser's inaugural edition of our new live webcast series, U.S. Global Health Policy in Focus which is devoted to discussing current and critical issues facing the U.S. government's role in global health. Each session will include leaders in their fields talking about their – oh, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I already started the presentation. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Each session will feature leaders in their field talking about their experiences, um, some of the challenges they faced in addressing global health challenges around the world. 
Our first session surpassed our expectations, so for that we are eternally grateful for your participation. And while today's focus, the focus of today's discussion will be a bit different than yesterday's webcast, I, I know that the conversation will be no less rich and enlightening. So with that, I know we are eager to hear from our guest, so thank you and again, welcome. So I, I don't think Michelle needs much of a further introduction, but, but just a word or two. Um, I think he's well known to everyone in this room, but Michelle has worn many different hats over the course of his very distinguished um, health career uh, as a very accomplished scientist, um, a researcher, a clinician, um, an advocate. Uh, he's been associated with the fund in many different ways um, as the inaugural chairman of the fund's technical review panel, as a member of the board, and then as vice chair. Um, and immediately before um, becoming the executive director of the fund, he served as France's global AIDS ambassador. And actually, Michelle, I think this month marks your two-year anniversary as executive director of the fund. So congratulations to you and welcome. We're really very glad to have you here today. Thank you, Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, uh, Alicia, Alice. And thank you, Steve. And, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much um, to CSIS, Kaiser, uh, for, the, for this, and Friends of the Fight for this opportunity. It's, it's a pleasure to be here um, in, in Washington and, and uh, to, to have this opportunity to address um, you and, and have a discussion with, uh, with this particular audience um, here. In times where, where we have to talk about global health, where we have to advocate for development. So uh, let me just say that I'd like to touch uh, briefly on four areas here. One is remind how seriously a downturn in the globalizing economy can affect the poorest and the most vulnerable and risks widening even further the, the gap between the richest and the poorest countries. And second, I'd like to recall how the international community now, eight years from the Geneva G8 meeting in 2001, which is an important meeting for us at the Global Fund, it's the meeting where the first pledges came uh, to the Global Fund, how the world has so successfully taken on health as a key means of reducing inequities between the richest and the poorest. I'll then touch on the Global Fund's portfolio and about some of the innovations in development that Global Fund has brought. And finally, I'll discuss some of the challenges that we presently face at the Global Fund. And of course, the overarching theme of this presentation and of our discussion has to be that we, we need to find all together the means to ensure that development and particularly health in development remains a global priority and that the gains, the extraordinary gains that were made in the last decade uh, are not lost. So first on growing inequities in our globalizing world. Um, as, as everyone knows well here, uh, I guess, the overall um, number of, of people living in extreme poverty has quite significantly decreased in the last 20 years. And as you can see on the slide, the proportion of people living in extreme poverty below $1 a day uh, has declined from 32 to 19 percent between 1990 and 2004. And that decrease in, 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 in poverty has largely been fueled by the unprecedented participation in the world economy of what's called the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. But, and there is no doubt that globalization have improved, has improved the lives of, of millions of people. But let's also be clear, globalization has not been without its victims. Um, and the hundreds of millions of people left in illiteracy, hunger, disease, and, and poverty. What this slide shows in the arrow and the red bar below is that uh, actually the share of the poorest quintile in national consumption 
in 2004 was 3.9 percent as compared with 4.6 percent in 1990. And that means that inequities have been increasing in the developing countries, whereas over the mean overall um, poverty level in, in the world has increased. And if inequities had increased within countries, they have also increased in between the richest and the poorest countries. Uh, according to the WHO Commission on Social Determinants in Health, um, the gross national income of the richest countries in 2005 was, as you can see on this slide, 120 times the GNI of the poorest countries, as compared to 60 times the GNI of the poorest countries 15 years ago. So growing inequities. And finally, one more slide, and this comes from the World Bank. And this slide shows that developing countries are anticipated to expect a significant fall in GDP growth in the next two years with the crisis. We talk a lot about the crisis in our countries, in our rich countries, but the crisis will impact severely on the developing world. And the World Bank, as you can see here, projects a, down, uh, a marked down from 6.4 to 4.5% in 2009 for economic growth, and this would translate in an, an additional 40 million people in, in poverty. So the ripples of this crisis are likely to be enormous. My point here is that inequities in health uh, are, of course, among the most immediate, the most evident, and the first priority people talk about when we travel to, and when you travel to countries. And when it comes to infectious disease, and, and the, the data on this slide are familiar to all of you, of course, 90% uh, of the burden of infectious diseases is concentrated in the developing world, whereas, as you know, um, those countries would account for only 20% of the world's wealth and only 12% of global expenditure on health. And AIDS, TB, and malaria, although treatable and preventable, continue to kill over 4 million people every year. This is a picture of Geneva. I already discussed why Geneva is so important to us at the Global Fund. Um, but for the reasons I, I just said, uh, I'd like to come back to Geneva, and I'd like to restate that equity should, I believe, in, in, in difficult times, economic times, that, that we're facing, features centrally in the debate about development aid, including inequities in access to, to, to health care. The rich cannot forget, in times of economic downturn, their responsibility to help minimize those inequities. And if I go back to the Geneva G8 communique, it spoke of, quote, breaking the vicious circle of poverty and disease. Geneva were the meet was the meeting where the first pledges to the Global Fund were made with the promise that the fund should be operational before the end of the year. And, and Lisa and some of you in the audience were in Brussels in 2001 where, when we gathered together to design what would be a Global Fund. And yes, it was operational before the end of the year, actually December 31, 2001. And we saw, I think, an extraordinary example of what the world can do when it comes together with a common purpose. Uh, since 2001, whoops, something wrong here. I'm missing a slide, but that slide was to show that since 2001, we've seen an extraordinary increase in resources, in international resources for AIDS that went, exceeded actually 10 billion uh, per year, 10 billion last year, 2008. And this slide now shows that a similar extraordinary increase in, in, in funding for AIDS um, did occur in this country, in the U.S., with a U.S. contribution that went from less than half a billion dollars in 2000 to nearly six billion dollars in, in 2008. With, with new resources, we've also seen a lot of creativity around new instruments to, to, to fundraise, to, 
to fundraise and also to deliver health. Uh, Gavi and, and the World Bank uh, map or multi-country AIDS program in, in 2000. Gavi has now been uh, raising resources, as you know, in international capital markets through what's called the, the IFIM, the International Finance Facility for Immunization. The Global Fund made its first grants in 2002. The U.S. committed to three significant initiatives with PEPFAR 2003, then the Presidential Malaria uh, Initiative and, and um, a specific effort on neglected tropical diseases more, more recently. UNITAID was established in 2005, and uh, another, a number of other new means of, of, of financing global health uh, were, were, were generated. Uh, two of those I'll just mention uh, relate directly to the work of the Global Fund. One is the Product Red initiative that all of you would know here in the, in the U.S., which is a branding and consumer-led initiative that brought around 140 million U.S. dollars into the Global Fund in a year and a half or less than two years uh, of existence. And then Debt to Health, um, which uh, from 2007 allowed me now to sign two agreements, one with Pakistan and Germany and the government of Germany, the other with Indonesia and the government in Germany, whereby Debt uh, which is a totally inert thing, you know, can, can really be transformed into a creative finance for, um, for health because it's being converted into resources for the Global Fund. That is, uh, a country such as Indonesia, uh, I mean Germany, sorry, agreed to um, go into that arrangement with, let's say, Indonesia, and so Germany would take 50 million out of what Indonesia is indebted to towards Germany and erase 25 million provided that the remaining 25 million are actually invested by Indonesia into the global fund programs in, in Indonesia. So it's really turning um, debt money into productive money going, going to health. And other initiatives let me here acknowledge uh, the initiative taken by Russia that decided to ultimately reimburse the Global Fund their grants and, and thus shift from being a beneficiary country to uh, being a, a donor country. So as a result of these efforts and of these new means of, of delivering uh, health, um, we, we've seen dramatic changes. And one you did mention, Lisa, is a dramatic increase in the number of people um, accessing antiretroviral treatment in the developing world. Um, and that came from, as you said, less than 300,000, let's say, in 2001, 2002, to now actually 4 million people on antiretroviral treatment, of which more than 2 million are supported by uh, global fund, uh, funded programs. And when it comes to the population level now in Malawi, or as shown here in Botswana on this slide, we're seeing signs of, of impact, that is, a decrease in, in mortality, in addition to the decrease in morbidity at a population scale. Uh, and, and you clearly see here the correlation between uh, decrease in mortality and increase in access to antiretroviral drugs. As you also said, Lisa, when it comes to TB, um, major progress, and what this slide shows is a sort of direct correlation between increased global resources for TB, and, and the Global Fund is currently provided an overall two-thirds of the available international funding for tuberculosis, a correlation between that increasing, increased global resources and the number of new sputum-positive cases detected and then, as seen in the purple line, the, the, the number of people eventually receiving DOTS, DOTS treatment. And we estimate that Global Fund programs have now allowed for an addition five, additional 5 million people to access uh, an, uh, anti tuberculosis uh, treatment in, in, in the last six years. 
and when it comes to malaria, one that, and, and you talked about the spectacular results, um, I'd like to show this particular map showing how in just four years the, the, the coverage in, um, long la with long-lasting impregnated bed nets has, has increased in, in, in the African uh, continent. And we're now able to, to really think of achieving universal coverage, I believe, in the next two to three years and hopefully reach the MDG um, uh, when, when it comes to, to malaria, perhaps earlier than 2015. This is another slide on malaria. And what it shows is the uh, declining cases uh, in, in malaria and declines in child mortality um, in, in here in, in, in Rwanda health, health facilities. But we have evidence from a number of endemic countries now, be it Rwanda, Zanzibar, Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia, Burundi, uh, also Kenya, Mozambique, Swaziland, South Africa, where substantial reductions in somewhere between 40 and up to 70 or 95 percent in Zanzibar uh, reductions in, in malaria-related deaths uh, have been observed in the last two to three years. What this particular slide shows is that, is, is to the right of the slide, the dramatic decline in, uh, in outpatients and in inpatient cases relating to malaria in uh, health facilities in Rwanda as the incidence decreased of malaria case by 64% by in these uh, years 2006 and 2007. And as you may see with the dotted line, an increase in the case of non-malaria related illnesses taken care of by that hosp those hosp health facilities. So this is a direct evidence of how, of one of the means by which what people call vertical funds, you know, directly impact on, positively impact on, on health systems uh, because with a greatly relieved malaria burden, hospitals are actually capable to manage other health-related conditions more effectively. And these results in malaria, um, you know, I, I really think are among the strongest, the strongest signs ever seen that the world is actually able to act and to, to halt and to reverse major infectious diseases as we all aim at in uh, MDG6. And this has led to the transformation in the lives of millions of people. Um, I shan't go into detail into the story of Marceline here um, for reasons of time, but I, I can't you know, prevent myself from, from just bringing one very briefly, one, one story here. Marceline is one of the people that were, that were photographed in a project that the Global Fund has run with uh, Magnum. And uh, some of you may have seen the exhibition at the Corcoran's uh, uh, Museum uh, um, uh, that the, 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 this summer. Uh, but Marceline, when she was diagnosed with, with AIDS, had, had already lost uh, two of her sisters and, and her husband to AIDS. And you see here uh, Marceline pictured uh, as, as her brother takes her on his bicycle for a 15 kilometers ride to the clinic to get her antiretroviral drugs. And Marceline has regained much of her lost weight. Uh, she has regained life. And she says that if, if it wasn't to take her medicines every day, uh, morning and evening, she would actually, quote, forget that, that she has AIDS. Um, and, and this is something we, we, we do have to keep in mind. So a few words about the Global Fund itself and, and you know, looking at the audience, I know that many of you are familiar with what the Global Fund is. It is a public-private partnership, as we call it, an innovative public-private partnership. And I, I like us to be called a pi public-private partnership, although I think this doesn't quite capture enough the key role that the civil society uh, is playing and has been playing in, 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 in our activities. It supports programs that reflect country ownership. That is, it responds to country demand, to the requests formulated by local stakeholders in an inclusive national process that goes through what we call the country coordinating 
uh, mechanism or CCM. It only supports interventions that are evidence-based with all proposals being reviewed by a, an independent technical review panel. And finally, it is performance-based. Uh, that is, we go with disbursements, uh, disbursements that are dependent on, upon implementing countries achieving the, the targets that we have been negotiating with them, that they have set, and that we have been negotiating with them at the time of, of the grant agreements. Our portfolio now, um, 15 billion in approved uh, grants, of which more than 7 billion have now been dispersed through over 600 grants in 140 countries. That is in all, all eligible countries, be them the poorest countries of the world or some of the lower middle and middle income uh, countries. As you see here, based on demand, about 60% of the funding goes to HIV AIDS, 25 to malaria, 15 to, to TB. Um, and this is showing the Global Fund's contribution to the uh, increase in, in the number of, of people receiving antiretroviral treatment. I'll skip this slide. We discussed it earlier. This shows you the portfolio in malaria and TB. And as I said, the fund now contributes about two-thirds of the international funding that is available for both TB and malaria. And this shows you the 140 countries with global fund grants that is, again, all eligible low- and middle-income countries receiving at least one grant in one of the diseases. The point on this slide is that the, 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 the poorest countries are, are specifically targeted by global funds so that the, the global fund resources overwhelmingly reach the poorest countries, as you can see here from the left, two uh, bars that correspond to the countries with the lowest per capita income. Here is a little more about reaching those who are in, in need. Uh, for example, 60% of the funding so far approved by the Global Fund are for Sub-Saharan Africa. 65% of the overall funding that we have committed to support orphans just go to the Southern Africa region, which is, of course, the epicenter of the epidemic and of the orphan issue. When it comes to diseases, 35% of our funding going on antiretroviral treatment goes to Southern Africa. And when it goes to malaria and TB, as you can see on the slide, we're strongly targeting the, the, the countries with, with the highest burden of, of both diseases, that is 19 African countries that account for about 90% of malaria burden on the continent and the 22 so-called high burden countries uh, when it comes to, to, to TB. And still on reaching those in need and the vulnerable, this is a slide showing that um, <clears throat> the Global Fund, when it comes to uh, harm reduction programs that are so important to prevent the spread of HIV among HIV, among uh, IV drug users, we are funding actually harm reduction programs in all countries that are eligible to the Global Fund in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, before the fund, um, prevention uh, in, in injecting drug users in that region and was was basically and virtually ignored. The fund is now the largest support of these programs in the world with an investment of close to $900 million. I'll skip this, this slide, and I shan't go into the detail of the calculation. I'm sure we'll come back to this in the discussion because that's the most pressing issue, of course, is about the resource in, in our resources in 2010. But let me put it in, in a, a very simple way and not go into the scenarios here. Um, in 2007, our board uh, looked at three potential scenarios of growth of the Global Fund, uh, a low, middle, and, and high scenario. 
And we're exactly, when it comes to the demand that we have seen and the extraordinary increase in demand that we have seen in 2008, we're actually exactly following the, the middle scenario and we expect and we anticipate to reach the 8 billion figure in 2010 that you, Lisa, or Alicia, I don't remember, mentioned in the introductory remarks. And so this is why I'm coming here uh, to Washington with a very clear and, and simple uh, request that I, I realize will be a challenge, a request for funding of 2.7 billion in 2000, for 2010 from the U.S. that is 30 percent of that 8 billion figure. Now I'm putting forward this 8 billion figure as something we anticipate, something we foresee, something that I of course do not know whether it will be the real figure because again by definition we respond to the demand and uh, I will only know by June and July how much demand will come to the uh, global fund. Let me say that obviously, you know, the resources are, are the, the, the driving force to, to sustainability and, and new resources and sustainable resources will be needed in our fight for, for, for health, for global health. But sustainability is not only about resources. Sustainability is also about addressing the weaknesses of health systems, and I'll come back to that. Resource is also about ensuring that we're using the most effective interventions, that is, ed interventions that are evidence-based. Um, sustainability is also, as said on the slide, promoting human rights, that is, making sure that stigma and discrimination do not prevent those who are most in need to actually access preventive and treatment services. And it's also progressively, and as we do in, in Rwanda, uh, using the opportunities afforded by scaling up in global health to strengthen the social safety, safety net in poor countries, that is, uh, having health, health insurance and social protection as part of the health system package. But it, it's also sustainability, building and strengthening our partnerships. Our partnerships on the ground with, with the bilaterals. And I'd, I'd like here to actually express my gratitude to the many uh, people I have seen on the ground, the PEPFAR staff, the, the USG staff, the embassies in countries where I travel and where I, I, I find people who are extraordinarily familiar with the Global Fund jargon processes and are truly committed to, to support the Global Fund and to support countries in actually best implementing um, the, 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 res the, the programs that are funded with, with our resources. Um, I, I, I do think, uh, you know, with, with the successes that I'm discussing with you today, that we have to really think about what bilaterals can do best and what multilateral can, can do best uh, and where is the best added value of, of the two approaches uh, in, in scaling up access to to, to prevention and, and treatment. On the multilaterals, there's still work to do, and I know Bill Steiger discussed that briefly when, when he was with you a, f a few weeks ago. I fully agree that we need more flexibility here when it comes to the work of the multilateral agencies on, on the ground, and more joint accountability for results, um, and, and, and including uh, I think a, a better proximity of those agencies with the civil society uh, on, on the ground. Um, this is a, a, a slide mentioning again what, what I just did on, on, on uh, <clears throat> our activities and our relationship with, with PEPFAR, with bilateral PEPFAR, <coughs> that I, I think has truly been very successful on the ground. <coughs> Sorry, including joint procurement of drugs and commodities, joint monitoring and evaluation, support for strengthening CCMs. The USG has put a number of specific grants to help strengthening the CCMs that have been extremely, extremely useful. But sure, we can do better, um, you know, and uh, we can do better with bilaterals. In some countries, I've seen 
um, in common basket funding, 24 countries sitting around the table uh, to decide on, on disbursements. And I, I, I think that can result in really in gridlock, and uh, that's not the best way uh, we, we, we should go for. Let me finally address some of, some of the challenges. And of course, uh, the first challenge is that of health systems. And let me again recuse this uh, ridiculous, damaging, whatever uh, vocabulary I could find here, debate about vertical funding versus funds versus horizontal funds. And Steve, you, you did run this um, session on health systems in, in Mexico at the time of the AIDS conference. I think we all agree AIDS, TB, and malaria, as we, as we scale up, have revealed the profound weaknesses of health systems in countries that were existing, of course, before we would scale up, but, but our ability to scale up in these diseases have re revealed those weaknesses like never before. But Global Fund, and I would add Gavi, and I would add bilateral PEPFAR, have really changed uh, a, a de the development paradigm here by supporting both uh, access to preventive and, 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 and therapeutic interventions and support to health systems. I mean, Gavi, Global Fund, PEPFAR, and of course together with the IDA, you know, are the main funders of health systems. It's the vertical funds that are the main international funders of health systems. And when I talk about health systems, I of course talk about you know, the, the, the infrastructure, the procurement system, monitoring and evaluation, but I also talk about human resources and, and about data uh, collection and, and, and operational research. What the slide shows here is that we are currently devoting uh, approximately 35%, and that again, it's, it's in response to the demand that comes to, from countries. 35% of our resources go to what you would generically call health system strengthening, monitoring and evaluation, a too small percentage, 3% infrastructure and equipment, and human resources, 23%. And I was struck by how similar this figure is to PEPFAR, which is actually uh, devoting 32% uh, of its resources. So 35 and 32, very, very similar. Uh, we do have a, a health systems funding gap. Um, you know, Global Fund, PEPFAR, Gavi, uh, are, are, as I said, the, probably the biggest financiers of health systems in the world today, but we cannot do it alone. And, and here I'd like us all to be somehow honest with ourselves. Uh, the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health in 2001 you know, uh, 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 said that we would need somewhere about 35 to 50 US dollars per capita, per annum, in order to ensure that people access a basic health package. Um, and um, if, if we're serious about health system strengthening, we, we should realize that now, as the world spends about 10 or 12 US dollars per capita per annum, we're, we're, we will not be reaching full capacity in, in building health systems unless we have major additional resources. So again, let's focus on, on the resources. Let's focus on, on plans uh, with targets. Um, let's, let, let's, rather than spending time on, on, on sterile debates between vertical interventions and, and horizontal health, health systems str strengthening, which I, I really think is just a cruel distraction. Um, let me just dwell for a second on the role of the civil society. Um, and here is a, 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 a trainer in, in malaria teaching a village on how to use bed nets. Uh, currently, as you can see on this slide, about 50% of the funding uh, from Global Fund goes to uh, the civil society or to, let's say, non-government organizations at large, including faith-based organizations, community groups, the private sector, and organizations of people living with, with the diseases. 
And I'm very pleased that in the last round, round eight, we, we could offer people uh, the opportunity to apply for funds that would go specifically to community uh, systems strengthening, which is very much needed on the ground. May I also remind those of you who are not so familiar with our Global Fund jargon that we, when countries apply to Global Fund, they, na they now can apply to what we call dual track funding, that is, in the grant application have one, two principal recipients for the funds, one from the government and one from the non-governmental sector. Private sector is an important component of our, of our partnership. I, I talked briefly about Product RED, uh, but there are other efforts and very significant efforts from the private sector when it comes to uh, resource mobilization, the contribution of, of the foundations, and particularly of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and uh, Chevron, that was the first large company to, to join in what we call a corporate champions program. But there are many other ways by which the private sector also contributes to, to the funds through co-funding of programs on the ground and through pro bono services uh, that, that are helping implementation. Um, when it comes to data quality, uh, again, something that was actually, I, I picked some of the points that Bill raised. In, in his talk, because I, I think it could be a good platform for the discussion here. Um, we, we do have a number of strengths, I, I, I believe, at the Global Fund and, and the, 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 the major strength, and that follows the, the principles of the Paris Declaration and of, of the ACRA Agenda for Action, is managing for results. That is, we, we promote the use of data for funding decisions. Um, and therefore, uh, we also commit or are ready to commit funding if countries uh, request for it, funding uh, to be used for M&E uh, strengthening. We also have in-country ver data verification. All data that come to us are verified in-country for each disbursement with also on-site clinic checks each year and periodic audits. But we do also have challenges and, and weaknesses. We have gaps in surveys and surveillance that's not specific to the Global Fund. Let's not forget that most of the countries where, where we're funding programs actually do not even have the basic demographic data. Um, we, we do have challenges uh, with, with the partners to truly align and jointly support monitoring and, and evaluation. And there are issues around incentives to use evidence and data to improve programs. And you may have seen one of the articles on this topic uh, in The Lancet from Chris Murray uh, on, on, on some of the Gavi data recently. Finally, procurement. And, and um, here I'd like to acknowledge Bill's comment on the fact that the fund has largely supported uh, procurement that creates no distortion in markets and respected intellectual property. But Bill also raised the question of whether the fund can achieve the best value for, for money. And it's, it's probably true that a number of countries, we are again a system of, of country ownership. So it's probably true that some countries can, can do better when it comes to value for money in buying drugs. Um, and there is a tension between the principle of country ownership and, and how much value for money you can actually get when it comes to buy drugs. This is why we have now introduced what we call a voluntary pool procurement so countries that wish so can actually adhere to a central procurement by the Global Fund. But let me also say that there are limits to what we can hope. And here I'll just show you, and these are my, my last slides, um, Two, two examples. First, the example of ACTs. And as you can see, in the last three years, uh, 05 to 07, uh, when it comes to ACT, we have witnessed both a decline in the median price of ACTs as well as a decrease in the range of price in between countries that are purchasing ACTs with global fund money. When it comes, however, here with second line 
ARVs, which, as you know, is and will be a major challenge uh, in terms of, 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 of cost, we've seen a decrease in the range of prices in between countries that buy the, the ARVs, but basically no change in, in the median price of, of the drugs. So let me just uh, finish with a few summary points. I've been discussing the fact that health is a key investment for development and for reducing the inequities between the global north and the global south, that more important than ever in the financial crisis, we should focus on the poorest and the most vulnerable, that investments in health are showing results and impact, and I think that is, is the strongest piece that we can bring to our advocacy uh, to the new administration on the Hill and to decision making makers at large, to the G8 in, in La Madalena uh, in, in, in July. I've talked about the increased convergence, convergence of donor political, economic, and security interests, something that you are discussing at CSIS with global health outcomes. Again, I think a strong piece of, of our advocacy and the fact that AIDS, malaria, TB treatment, and health systems challenges highlight the need for a long-term effort and lifetime commitments. But in fact, as I discussed, the fact that sustainability is not just about resources. So 2009 and 2010, to me, are absolutely key years. It's, it's years where we will either fail or, or succeed after building these successes that I, I discussed in, in my presentation in the last six years. I, I truly feel that these are mission-critical years. 2010 will see the replenishment of the IDA at the World Bank and the replenishment of the Global Fund for two, well, 2011 to 2013. That will take us to January 1, 2014, one year prior to the deadline of the MDGs. And it's also a critical year for for Gavi. So in the next two years, the poor of the world will really be watching to see whether we keep our financing commitments for global health in difficult times. A second opportunity I see in these two years is for us all to focus more than ever on results. As I said, I think results and impact are our strength. And at the time, you know, when the, 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 the world devotes so much effort to rescuing institutions that have failed, I think, I hope it will also spend equal effort on institutions that actually work. Um, <clears throat> and this means, of course, targeting resources, uh, you know, in, 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 an, in, a, in an efficient and cost-effective manner, as we discussed, building the partnership with the civil society and rewarding good performance. The third opportunity, and I've said that two or three times in, in, in this presentation already, is, and that's an imperative, of course, is acting to ensure that inequities between the rich and the poor are not further exacerbated by the financial crisis. And now it's the time to ensure that we, the gains we have made since Geneva 2001 are not lost. And so let me just finish on, on some quotes again from Geneva. And I really invite you to reread that, that communique. I find it extraordinary. We, Geneva was really a time with a vision. And in times of crisis, of course, we tend to, to lose that vision. We tend to be somehow in, in, in fear, in, in defensiveness, in, in, in bureaucracy somehow, limiting ourselves to what might be feasible rather to than actually reaching to, to fulfill ambitious uh, commitments. The Geneva G8 communique spoke of taking, quote, a quantum leap in the fight against infectious diseases. It said breaking the vicious circle of poverty and disease once for all, end of quote. It spoke of the G8's, quote, determination to, quote, make globalization work for all our citizens and especially the world's poor, end of quote. So it is that spirit of, of determination and commitment to, to equity in global health that should guide us in our advocacy effort and should guide us to the next G8 and, and beyond. So thank you for your attention. <clears throat> We 
Michelle, thank you very much for that um, comprehensive overview and for your willingness um, to be honest about what the accomplishments have been and also honest about what the remaining challenges are. And I like very much the note that you ended on because I think it is actually very important to look back before we can really look forward about where it is that we need to try to be going um, between now and 2015 or whatever deadline we want to set for ourselves. Um, so we have probably about 20, 25 minutes for some questions now. Um, and what I'd like to suggest we do is that we maybe group them in uh, you know, three or four questions at a time, just for time efficiency sake. Uh, and I'm going to ask my colleagues here who have um, microphones if they will help get around the room. And actually, particularly if you could keep an eye on this corner over here, because it's hard to see beyond the podium. So we have a question right here in the front row, I think. Hi, uh, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm Matt Kavanaugh from the Results Educational Fund. Michelle, thanks for being here. It's, I think, a key moment for you to be here and kind of sharing these messages with, with DC. And so on that, on that note, I have kind of two questions for you, specifically about what, what those in this room can do. It seems like we have an incredible opportunity right now in that for all of the success of the last administration on HIV and AIDS, one of the things is that that administration asked last year for a cut in half of the you know, U.S. contribution to the Global Fund. Congress was able to get it, get it up to level funding, but that's a real challenge, right? We now have an administration that ran all of the people in major, major places, said on the campaign trail that they wanted to fully fund the Global Fund. So what do you need from folks in this room to help make that clear, bold case that this is exactly what this new administration's kind of vision for foreign policy is? And then on the other side of not just funding available, but also demand, right? I think we all have a massive worry that countries will get a very clear message from the last round of funding in which for the first time we weren't able to fund at the full levels requested, all of the funds requested because, of, because there hadn't been enough donations, that countries will pull back, right? That they'll stop expanding and that we'll have a problem of demand and that we won't have demand to reach this eight billion even though we know that it's needed from past years. So what can we do to kind of solve that problem as well? Thank you. Is there another question we can take, please, in the third row there? Let's take both questions together. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jennifer Redner. I'm with the International Women's Health Coalition. Thank you for being here today. My question is related to the Global Fund Gender Equality Strategy. Could you speak a little bit about the plans for implementation of this strategy? Thank you. Perfect follow-up. My name is Janet Fleischman, and I wanted to also ask you to speak uh, a word or two about the interesting new development of this gender strategy, both about women and girls and about men who have sex with men, and the piece on the women and girls side that is focusing on integrating sexual and reproductive health and HIV services. Why don't we go ahead with those? Okay, thank, thank you. I mean, um, already two key questions, um, although very, very different. Matt, on, on, on your question, um, let me, on the first point, say that what people in this room can do, uh, I mean, this room is filled with one of the, some of the strongest uh, um, groupings of people um, in, in when it comes to advocacy in, in global health. So the message is, in times of, cr of financial crisis, uh, in times where where budgets are a danger, and uh, um, although somehow many of us feel that perhaps when it comes to funding development, development funding may not be as, quote, soft funding as, as it would have been in the 80s or, or the 90s, uh, clearly th there, is, there is a source of, of major concern for all of us. So the message is let us all together advocate for development um, and development aid to be a priority of the foreign policy of the new administration. And let's advocate health, uh, health in addition to education, but health as being one of the priorities uh, in, in, in development because, um, because health is the most, as I said, immediate and evident of the inequities because by fighting AIDS, TB, and malaria, we're directly fighting the erosion of human capital that these epidemics are, uh, are, are generating in the developing world. Because 
also we have shown the world what we can achieve. Uh, we can be fully accountable in the money we have invested and we can show results and impact and progress in global health as, as never seen before in the history of, of, of public health. So we, we, we do have these, these, I think, very strong arguments in advocacy and, and this is the first thing I, I'd like to ask from, from the audience whether uh, you know, people here are in government or non-governmental organizations. I agree with you uh, when it comes to uh, the risk that the trust that countries have, have built in, in the fund and in general in aid uh, may, be, may suffer uh, if, if, if we are not keeping to our commitments. Um, you know, looking back at the history of the fund, and, and I can't prevent myself from looking at the second row here <laughs> uh, in, in the audience, um, but, you know, Scott, Margaret, Judy, you, you remember it, 2002, 2003, uh, the requests coming to the Global Fund were sort of very shy projects, like the type of project that would be funded, you know, like the bilaterals used to do in the 80s, you know, uh, a pilot project of 300 people on antiretroviral treatment in District 121 in the north and eastern part of Kenya, yes? Uh, nothing to do with the scale at which we need to address the, the, the diseases because countries were, were still, you know, looking into what's this new instrument and, and is, will that be sustainable? Will, will that be expanding? And then progressively, that trust came. I think the trust from the donors, and we saw that in the 2007 uh, very significant replenishment of the Global Fund, and the trust from the countries. And to me, the unprecedented demand that we saw in 2008 is really a very strong sign of that trust. So yes, uh, if we are, you know, we, there is a risk of, of losing that trust with, I think, which is, of course, a, a major risk for, for the people who are in need and serv of services and would not access those services. But let me also say it bluntly. I think it's a political risk uh, as well. And, and this is where, you know, it comes to the discussions you're having so often here at CSIS about health is, is politics and health is, 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 is global health is, is foreign policy. Um, You know, I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily say that um, in round eight, the Global Fund Board, but that's more of a technical discussion for later, was not able to, to fund. I think in, in times of crisis, it is also not unreasonable that we try and find as much efficiency gains as we have, as, as we can. And the 10%, as you know, is not a 10% decrease in funding that was arbitrarily, is being arbitrarily applied to each grant. It's our effort to, f to try and find those 10% efficiency gains as we negotiate grants. It will be easy in some cases, more difficult in others. And it's also uh, efficiency gains that we have to apply to ourselves in, in the functioning of the Secretariat. Now, thank you, uh, both of you, for, for your questions on, on gender. <clears throat> The, uh, we will be presenting uh, the paper on, on implementation to our policy and strategy committee uh, about around March 15, so I, I don't want to expand too much here on that. But let me say that um, fighting the inequities relating to gender as, as a driving factor for the AIDS epidemic in, in the world, addressing um, gender inequities, fighting violence against women, um, paying, supporting more strongly sexual and reproductive health are clearly in, in our priorities. Let's also be clear, Global Fund is not a top-down organization. You know, we are not deciding for countries what they want to do. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll follow Matthew's Matt's, Matt's call. It's, it's also your responsibility, our joint responsibility 
to make sure that countries, when they send us their requests, you know, our strategy is basically is, is to show that we, we give a high priority to these issues, but we will not fund something that the countries do not request us to, to, to fund. So uh, it is our common responsibility to actually have all of these issues very high on the agenda of the countries when they submit that request to us. Further questions? My name is Ahmed Mir. I used to be uh, dealing with science policy at the State Department for many years. Uh, the question that I'm asking is maybe tangential. I don't know so much about the Global Fund. But what are you doing in terms of long-term leadership in these countries in terms of uh, both research collaboration and uh, building up uh, expertise? Because at some time you want to see both uh, facilities for drugs being manufactured in these countries and uh, leaders in these countries. Also, something that I found very difficult, and I imagine it's involved here, was the IPR issue. And the, for example, there was a vaccine institute in Korea when I was there, and we couldn't get support uh, all the way from the US and many countries <coughs> to develop vaccines, vaccines really that are important to the developing country. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Charlotte Colvin, and I work for PATH, and I, I have a somewhat related question. I noticed in your presentation, which was very good, thank you very much, um, the importance of m and &E in health system strengthening and specific mention of operations research as an important part of that, yet only 3% of global fund monies are going to m and &E and 5% are going to academic institutions, and as someone who's responsible for supporting a lot of these activities, um, we often find that the first thing cut out of the budget is the impact evaluation of the operations research, or that when it's funded, there's very weak capacity. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on sort of the future, especially in the context of the financial crisis, for building up the local research um, institutions and capacities in the country. Let's go over here to the front row. Hi, Michelle, thank you for um, joining us today. Um, a question about health systems uh, strengthening. My name is Eric Williams, and I work with uh, Physicians for Human Rights, but specifically on uh, the Health Workforce Advocacy Initiative, which is a civil society-led initiative uh, affiliated with, with GUA. Um, so in reviewing the TRP review um, for health system strengthening, uh, there were about 45 uh, requests for, for grants uh, funding, um, only of which 25 were, were, were recommended for funding. There seems to be a little bit of a gap in terms of how do we encourage more countries to make specific requests for health system strengthening? Um, there seems to be clear bottlenecks to where we might, or where the fund might be able to kind of clear up the, the logjam, if you will, in terms of um, making it more clear as to how to how to strengthen those, how to put in those requests for funding. Uh, and I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about how to raise the level of of interest in countries? Um, so that there are more requests for health system strengthening. Because I think that we would all agree that at the end of the day, um, you really can't address any of the three diseases unless you have a strong system for health. Let's take one last question right in the front row here. Yep. My question fits in nicely with what you have just said about health system strengthening. I know the Global Fund and PEPFAR, both under the leadership of Mark Dybul and you, they have really done excellent work for health system strengthening. And I'm just wondering how we could accelerate this. Uh, in any given country, take Africa or Asia or Latin America, Caribbean, nearly 40% of the health system is helped by faith-based organizations. Often mission hospitals and clinics are in places where government dare not go. Uh, if you concentrated on this sector as well, which is so strong already, Maybe we could uh, accelerate the health system strengthening, and I'd like to know your views. I saw that 5% of it goes to faith-based, and what can we do? If we rely on CCMs, there is a whole government bureaucracy, and uh, what else could we do? I know you are innovative, you are a pioneer, and you are very dynamic. You'll do it. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, that was the answer to the question. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, right. So, shall I just take those few questions? Well, let, let me um, have the, the, the questions uh, relating somehow to research uh, together. You know, first, I, I, I fully agree with you uh, that without support to leadership, to, let's say, governance at large, uh, you know, we won't achieve uh, sustainable results in, in global health. But, you know, the Global Fund cannot do it all <laughs> by itself, and, and that is something uh, I'd like to, to emphasize clear here. Our mandate and the mandate we received from the international community when it came together in 2001, the public sector, the governments from the north, the governments from the south, uh, the, the private sector, the civil society, the communities affected by the diseases, the multilateral agencies all coming together. The mandate was we have to do something uh, to bring to scale, to real scale, uh, the interventions aimed at prevention and, and treatment. So that's our, our basic mandate. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I am, I don't know, I've been in my career um, one of, the, I, I hope, <laughs> of the strongest advocates for investments in, in research and in innovative technologies for prevention and treatment and, and vaccines. Um, but when it comes to Global Fund, uh, that is not the mandate of the Global Fund. Uh, however, the mandate of the Global Fund is to learn lessons uh, as we implement of what, from what we're doing so as to improve our means of implementing. And that's a new science called operational research. Um, and operational research, I truly believe, is in the mandate of what we should fund. Uh, operational research is, is a sort of real-time assessment of what is being done and a multidisciplinary approach to that assessment from, from clinical science to social science to uh, economics um, and to, um, to geopolitics. Um, Countries, when they apply to Global Fund, can request for up to 10% in the grant for operational research. But I must say that, and there's, I would agree with you both, there is a bit of a vicious circle since there is so little research capacity actually being built in countries. That's one of the reasons um, that for, for, for which uh, operational research is not actually a priority and our requests for funding operational research in the grants that come to us are, are extremely, actually extremely small. Um, yes, the 3% figure uh, for uh, monitoring and evaluation, I would agree with our colleague from PATH, uh, is, is too small. Um, again here, we are responding to what countries decide to be their priorities. And it's our, as we all feel, how, how the, the amount of data and the quality of data are, are important to, to all of us and to the success of the programs, to programming the interventions. Um, we, we, we need to help countries to actually ha invest more into, into MNE. And that's that advocacy is to me the role of our partnership. The, and I, I keep saying that the Global Fund is not an institution talking to partners, but the Global Fund is a partnership by itself. We are made of partners. Sorry to be pedantic, I say we are ontogenically a partnership, yes? And uh, um, so within that partnership, we have WHO, we have World Bank, we have UNAIDS, we have UNICEF, we have the bilaterals, the USG, uh, among others, that, that on the ground have to help countries to actually have m &E higher on the priority agenda in the request. And it's a bit of the same answer as I, as I did to our colleagues on, on, on the gender strategy. Um, 
When it comes to, to health system strengthening, again, I would partly answer your question by saying the partners in the partnership, this is a very fragile model, a model entirely relying on the partnership. And all of us in the room know that that partnership is, is functioning, you know, in places very well with much strength and in other places is just very weak. It depends on institutions. It depends on individuals. It, um, it depends on, an, on, on a number of factors. It cannot be controlled top down. It can only live from our efforts to, 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 to nurture that partnership and to have partners constantly feeling in countries partners the WHO representative, the UNAIDS, UCC, the, the representative uh, of, from the USG, the embassy and or the PEPFAR representative, that they own the global fund. We all own the global fund. Uh, on one of my slides I, I was saying, I didn't read it actually, that the global fund is truly a, a, a global public good. It is our collective public good and we all own it. And so if if the partners do not feel, uh, fulfill that role of actually helping countries to realize what you're saying, that we need more effort, more structured effort on health systems, um, then, then those requests will, will not come to us or to Gavi. But let's say there are difficulties there. The first is that um, it's difficult to find the proper indicators Yes, so to, to have health system strengthening enter into what all of us wish, which is a performance-based model for, for funding and for disbursements. Um, then there is an issue about resources. I said in my talk that if it's to go from $11 per annum per capita to 11.5, you know, that's not the way we will truly move uh, the, the, the health system issue. But let's also be careful saying that we, you know, you said something like we won't be able to scale up further without strengthening health systems. Um, I think the demand that we have been receiving from countries in round eight uh, and the demand that, you know, I somehow anticipate we will be receiving in round nine is the very example that actually countries have understood how they can in parallel uh, build demand for um, commodities and, and delivery of, of preventive and, and treatment interventions and in parallel to that uh, health system strengthening. Um, but health system strengthening for health system strengthening is, I, I really believe, something that won't work unless we have the $50 per annum and per capita and then we would say, okay, we have that money, how do we best allocate it to strengthening health systems. At this time, what we have to do is to use every opportunity, every most cost-effective opportunity, as we scale up interventions on the three diseases that are the number one killer disease in the developing world, to strengthen in parallel health systems, not for the, for the sake of strengthening health systems, but for actually being better and better able to deliver prevention and, and treatment in, in these countries. And that is somehow answering the first, hopefully, uh, the, the first part of, of your question. The second part was about faith-based organizations. There's nothing that prevents that 5% figure to actually grow. And uh, a few months ago, a year ago in Washington, we, we had a meeting uh, with, with faith-based organizations. And um, I, I was meeting with some of you earlier here. and. and you have the, the manual with you on, on how faith-based organizations can access. Here's the manual. Thank you for the publicity. That uh, uh, can, how can faith-based organizations access global fund funding? So it is, but I would take your point that sometimes it is difficult to find your way through the CCM. Um, the CCM, you know, is a very democratic uh, concept, it's, it's built on, on what we see as an ideal world, you know, la citta ideale, uh, 
where, where indeed all stakeholders of, uh, come together, the government, the faith-based organization, the civil society, the vulnerable groups, the bilaterals, the multilaterals. The reality is that, again, in some places it works extremely well. In some places it doesn't work at all. But the, the reality check is also that let, let's, let's be, you know, um, true to ourselves. It, it, it needs a little time. Global Fund is really, quote, operational somehow, I think, since maybe 2004. So it's, it's a three and a half years old child. You know, those CCMs require a little more support and a little more time to really be easily accessible uh, as, we, as we would all wish. And, and, and that tension between how urgent are the things we need to do and how slowly some of the means <laughs> progress is, is a tension we live every day. So I'm going to apologize in advance because we need to be out of here right at 2 o'clock. But I think if we speak fast, we have time maybe for a last question or two. So um, if we, the lady maybe with the pink turtleneck and the gentleman in the, in the green shirt, please. And then let me just say, Michelle will be around for a little bit afterwards. We can adjourn to the back and there'll certainly be some time if others of you have pressing questions that you can speak with him um, briefly when we're done. Um, please. Thank you. My name is Kelly Curran from Japaigo Johns Hopkins University. Just a quick question. Um, I very much appreciate how field-driven the Global Fund is and responsive to what countries put in their proposals, but I was wondering if you could speak uh, a bit about the role of um, the technical review panel, in particular in guiding maybe the balance of what interventions are funded under proposals. I'm thinking particularly of balances between uh, treatment and prevention in the area of HIV um, and uh, some of the emerging prevention interventions such as male circumcision, for example, which countries have not been so eager to take up or many countries um, in southern Africa have not been so eager to take it up. Does the Global Fund see a role in uh, gently encouraging countries to pursue those interventions? Well, so, sorry, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Renan Rosemer from Pan American Health. And uh, Michelle, thank you very much as usual, very clear and uh, to the point. Two observations. Uh, one, I think that uh, you've been a little shy. I think one of the main uh, impacts that the Global Fund will have in development is the CCM, in the sense that uh, you know it's forcing a cohabitation of the public and the private sector in the countries, which you know sometimes ends up like in bad marriages. But I think that learning how to do it is also part of the important thing. But my question really has to do with something a little different. Um, the new window or the fund, which has to do with the support of national strategies. Uh, for those who are not familiar, it's a, by invitation only some countries are being invited to apply for uh, supporting their national strategies. In a certain way, that means that the fund is taking a more technical role of assessing the national strategies, uh, which is not what was envisioned at the beginning of the role of the... Of the. So how, how are you dealing with that subject? In other words, who decides whether the strategy in country X is worthy of support? Thank you. And, and these are both relatively complex questions. So <laughs> well, on um, yeah. some length, but maybe Michelle, at the highest thank, level, thank you can you, try Lisa. to respond. And, and thank you for the questions. Yeah, they're they're important questions. First, the TRP is um, the TRP can take a strong stance, um, and um, um, it's never easy to speak about oneself. But you know, in the first session of the first TRP. In 2002, uh, we decided that we would just not consider an HIV request that would not have both treatment and prevention. And if you remember those years, 2001 and 2002, these were still years where people were discussing whether, you know, resources being scarce, uh, one shouldn't... Uh, go for prevention, quote, rather than for treatment. And it wasn't the sort of acquired dogma that one is complementary to the other and the, should, the two should go together. So um, that was a decision of the TRP. But uh, the answer to your question is, um, you know, the, the board of the Global Fund, having all the constituencies that I've been mentioning uh, throughout the, the discussion, all members of the partnership, 
encourages a number of, of things. That's how we push the gender strategy, the sexual minority strategy that um, you, you, you mentioned, uh, I hope an IVDU strategy in the, in the coming months, and uh, encouraging countries to apply for health system strengthening. That's, that's what the, the Global Fund can do with a limit, which is, um, again, that to me, the principle of, of country ownership must be sacrosanct. This is a, a key to, to the long, medium and long-term success of our development efforts. For too long, the world or the rich world has been deciding for the others what they should do. The, um, but, so when it comes to male circumcision, I, I find it very difficult. Uh, I would agree with you reading the papers, and I actually in the former life, I was the first, the sponsor of the first trial on, on circumcision in, in, in South Africa. Um, reading the evidence from the literature, there's just no doubt about how effective that intervention may be. But then when it comes to, uh, I don't think it's just countries not taking up cir male circumcision, it's countries facing the many, many challenges uh, that this, that scaling up such an intervention would represent. And again, it takes time, it takes cultural time, it takes political time, it takes also technical support, um, and maybe it's still a little too early. And again, there's a tension between how much the urgency and how much we would achieve and, 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 and the time that is needed to do a number of things. Not a very good answer, but that's the one I can provide you with. Um, NSA, Herman, very important question. Um, let, let me just very briefly say that, you know, Global Fund in the very beginning has been funding projects, then more comprehensive programs, and now is opening to funding national strategies. Although I see the continuum there, of course, you know, the, the, the TB national, a, a program on TB that we would have been fi funding in round seven or eight is very, very close to actually funding a national TB strategy. And, and of course, one of the things that TR, the TRP has been looking at from the beginning is how consistent is the program that is submitted to us for funding with a national strategy. But here we, here we would be presented with a national strategy that other donors could potentially also use as a basis for funding. I fully agree with you. It is not up to an external entity to validate a national strategy. And I, I was quite firm on that in a recent intervention at the meeting of the International Health Partnership in Geneva. To me, a national strategy is validated by the country and owned by the country. And I don't believe there is such a thing as a supranational body, you know, that universally gives its blessing to, to national strategies. However, in order to, for a donor to fund something, you know, it, it, it needs that the donor sort of ap approves the, the, the content of what has been validated by the country. So um, for now, that is for 2009, in the experimental first wave of national strategy applications by invitations only, as you said, um, the TRP will be working in a totally different way from the usual way. Uh, the TRP will first start with a desk review of all available documents documenting a national strategy in a given country. It will not ask the country to write anything new. Just send in all the documents they have. And if that desk review uh, confirms that the country has indeed in its strategy all of the, quote, attributes of what a group currently chaired by the World Bank and WHO has uh, considered to be the necessary minimal attributes in, in a strategy, then the TRP would engage in, uh, in a dialogue at the country level with the country, going to the country, to how to improve and fine-tune that strategy. And then the country 
would write and send to the Global Fund a financial request and only a financial request without the narrative of a proposal saying, we've worked with you on the national strategy um, and um, we know that World Bank, we know that US government, we know that PEPFAR will fund this or that part and thus our financial request to you, Global Fund, is X percent of, of that strategy. And so as, as we move to that, I think we'll move to uh, funding comprehensive programs that are much more integrated, much more harmonized and, and aligned as we all aim at, you know, by adhering to the ACRA Agenda for Action and, and Paris Declaration principles. But it's Herman, it is, it is work in progress. So one of the less gratifying aspects of being the chair is to have to bring such an interesting discussion to a close, but I'm afraid we do need to do that. So actually, I want to thank all of you for your participation, um, for the great questions. Please join me in thanking Michelle for his candor and his insights in being with us today. <laughs>